What in the world is going on in the Middle East? Why is the region embroiled in such turmoil? What is ISIS all about? And how does the rise of ISIS relate to the regathering of the Jewish people to their homeland? And what is the biblical significance of the events in the Middle East? Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. The focus of world politics today is the nation of Israel in the Middle East, and that focus is one of many signs that we're living in the season of the Lord's return, because all of end times Bible prophecy focuses on Israel, just like today's newspaper headlines. The Middle East today is a cauldron of turmoil, and much of that turmoil has been stirred up by a mysterious group called ISIS that seemed to come out of nowhere. What is this group? What are they all about? And how do they relate to what the Bible says about Israel and the Arabs in the end times? Stay tuned for a presentation that will seek to answer these questions. Where in the world does ISIS fit into this picture? ISIS is a Sunni Muslim group that has transformed rapidly a terrorist group into a full-fledged army, and I mean rapidly. The group was founded by this man, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He's a recluse. He keeps to himself. I think he's afraid of assassination. He never stays the same place in, in a night. He's moving around all the time. He's only made two public appearances since he formed ISIS. He is a real recluse, and very, very little is known about this uh, particular uh, man. Uh, what we do know is that uh, uh, he became the leader of an Al Qaeda group, an Al Qaeda group that was called ISI, standing for the Islamic State of Iraq. That's what they call themselves. And because of that, he began to launch terror attacks across Iraq with the idea of taking over Iraq and turning it into a Muslim, a pure Muslim state with Sharia law. In 2013, he ventured into Syria and he changed the name of his group to ISIS, standing for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. He later changed it again to ISIL, Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Levant is a French word which means the Middle East. So you can see how he's expanding it. It starts out with Iraq, then it goes to Iraq and Syria, then it goes to Iraq and the entire Middle East. And then, in his most important public appearance in June of 2014, where he made a public speech for the first time, he declared the establishment of the Islamic State. And that's what he calls it today, IS, I-S, the Islamic State. He didn't call it ISIL or, or ISIS, he calls it IS. And that is the Islamic State. And let me tell you, that was the most important pronouncement that had been made by a Muslim in many, many years. Keep in mind that no Muslim caliphate, no Muslim empire has existed since the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire in 1922. When he declared an Islamic State, an Islamic caliphate, Muslims, radical Muslims at least, all over the world became excited. And they began to flood into the Middle East because they wanted to be a part of the establishment of the next Muslim caliphate, the next Muslim empire which they hope will be the empire that will take over the world. Let's consider for a moment what motivates these people. Folks, in February of 2015, this lady, Marie Half, a State Department spokesman, made the most incredible proclamation I think has ever come out of the mouth of a government employee. She said that the motivation of ISIS is the desire to get jobs, that these are people who need jobs. Here is her actual words, we cannot win the war on terror nor can we win the war on ISIS by killing them. Oh. We need to find them jobs. We need to get to the root cause of terrorism, and that is poverty and the lack of opportunity in the terrorist community. This is liberal thinking gone to seed. It is just pathetic, pathetic. This perverse idea that ISIS is driven by poverty and the need for a job. One of my, one of my staff members who doesn't even know anything about this, when I told him about this, he said, Dave, 
This is insane. I haven't heard one member of ISIS yet yelling, jobs, jobs, jobs. He said, all they seem to be yelling is Alu Akbar, Alu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. The real motivation, of course, is religion, and specifically the commands of the Quran. Now, these are verses right out of the Muslim holy book. To fight non Muslims until you exterminate all other religions, leaving Islam as the one and only religion in the world. What are they doing? They're following the dictates of their holy book. Muhammad is quoted in the Hadith as saying, I have been ordered to fight with the people until they say, none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. ISIS has become very quickly identified by their use of indescribable widespread radical terror. And this is in accordance with the Quran. In addition to military force, the Quran orders Muslims to terrorize non-Muslims. Surah 860, strike terror in the hearts of the enemies of Allah and in your enemies. And in, Allah then assures His followers that He will help them do this. I will instill terror in the hearts of unbelievers. Smite them above their necks and smite all their fingertips off them. It is not you who slay them, it is Allah. And concerning jihad or holy war, He says the Quran guarantees paradise to those who fight for Allah. In fact, in the Muslim religion, the only guarantee you have that you will go to heaven is if you die in combat fighting for Allah. Otherwise, there is no guarantee whatsoever. Even Mohammed said he wasn't sure whether he would go to heaven or not. And dying for Allah is presented as better than living. And if you are killed or die in the way of Allah, forgiveness and mercy from Allah are far better than all that others may amass of worldly wealth. It's a great thing to die for Allah. Also, martyrs are promised a, a, a sensual and luxurious life in paradise. In short, the Muslim paradise is one of eternal decadence. Let's consider for a moment the purpose of ISIS. We don't have to guess at it. We don't have to guess at their purposes because they have made this very, very clear. And you'll be surprised at what their number one goal is. Their number one goal always has been to overthrow the secular rulers of Islamic states. That's why Egypt is number one on their hit list. They want to take out the the secular leaders of Egypt and get someone in there who is an ayatollah, who is a a, a, a clerical type individual. They want to take out all of the secular leaders of all the Islamic countries, and that will then produce their Islamic caliphate. Number two is to take back the land of Palestine for Allah, exterminating Israel in the process. One of the reasons they're so determined to do that is because the Quran teaches that if you ever conquer a land for Allah, it becomes His. That He only owns the land you conquer. And that if you lose that land, you have an absolute obligation to go back and conquer it again. That's interesting. The Bible says the whole world belongs to our God. But according to the Quran, the only thing that belongs to Allah is what has been conquered by the sword. And the Ayatollah Khomeini argued that the reason that the that the, uh, uh, the Arabic countries, the Muslim countries had fallen into such disrepair in the 18th and 19th centuries simply was because they sat on the sidelines and allowed Israel to be established. And they have an obligation to destroy Israel. Number three is to conquer the rest of the world for Allah. And that includes, of course, the United States of America. Those are the three purposes of ISIS. Now, it's important to note something here, very important. The eradication of Israel is not the top priority. Nor is Israel viewed as a major obstacle to world conquest. I want to emphasize this because many Americans now are saying that we are to abandon Israel, we are to dump Israel. I see these bumper stickers all over the place. It's amazing. You turn on the radio, you hear people saying this. Abandon Israel, dump Israel. Many Americans are saying, if we will just abandon Israel and dump Israel, we'll have peace. Then the Muslims will leave us alone. They won't attack us anymore. Folks, that is so misguided. It is so misguided. It's utter nonsense. Israel is not the cause of Islamic terrorism toward the West. If Israel were to disappear tomorrow, fundamentalist Islam would still be determined to destroy America and to take the world for Allah. And if we were to abandon Israel, if that were to happen, and we're on the verge of doing it, we are right on the verge, the Muslim world would interpret that as cowardice. They would interpret it as proving that our word is meaningless. And they would say that we have proved what they say about us, that we are a depraved society devoid of values. The Arab world respects only strength, only strength. Let me give you an example of that. 
When the Arabs conquered the old city of Jerusalem in the War of Independence in 1948 and 49, they conquered the old city. You know what they did? They went to the Jewish quarter and they blew up every synagogue in the Jewish quarter. They burnt every Jewish house to the ground. The entire Jewish quarter was obliterated. Then they went to the Mount of Olives and they desecrated all the Jewish cemeteries and they took the stones from the Jewish cemeteries and took them out and used them as stepping stones to the latrines of the army camps. In 1967 when the Jews reconquered the city of Jerusalem there was panic throughout the Muslim world because they expected the Jews to do to them as they had done to the Jews. They expected the Jews to go in and burn the Arab quarter to the ground, blow it up. They expected the Jews to blow up the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. And the Jews never even touched the Arab quarter, and they never touched the Temple Mount. And in fact, the second day after they had won it, they called a press conference and said to the Arabs, we believe in freedom of religion, and although this now belongs to us, we're going to let you administer the Temple Mount. And to this day, even though the Temple Mount is under the sovereignty of Israel, when you go up there you're under control of Muslims. You can't touch your wife's hand. You can't read the Bible. You can't pray. You have to obey all their rules. The Jews thought this would prove to the Arabs that they wanted to live in peace with them. To the Arab mind all that the Jews did there was a sign of weakness. They don't have the will to destroy our quarter. They don't have the will to destroy the Dome of the Rock. These are weak people. And one day we will conquer them. The only thing they respect is power. And let me tell you, this same thing of trading land for peace whets the appetite of the aggressor and only makes them want more. They said, oh, there will be peace, peace if you will just give us the Gaza Strip. They gave them the Gaza Strip. What did they do? Move all the terrorists in and start shooting rockets into Israel. You don't get peace through appeasement. As Winston Churchill once said, appeasement never works because When you go down that road sooner or later you're going to be eaten by the crocodile. (laughs) And that's exactly what happens with appeasement. Do you remember Chamberlain who tried to appease Hitler? Do you know what Chamberlain said on his deathbed? He said, it would have all been all right if Hitler hadn't lied to me. (laughs) Well, what, what do you expect Hitler to do? Right now we're negotiating with Iran. What do you expect Iran to do? They're going to lie to us. They don't care anything about truth. They don't care anything about honor or valor. They're going to do whatever they can to get ahead and produce that nuclear bomb so they can drop it on Israel. Well, folks, what is going to be? uh, I, I love this. This is a quote from Netanyahu. He says, the Nazis wanted to establish the master race. ISIS wants to establish the master faith. And he is right on target. A man who always is able to see through it all. What's going to be the fate of ISIS? What's going to happen to them? Well, I can say with confidence here what's going to happen to them because the Bible makes it very clear. First, Psalm, I'm sorry, I've got on there Psalm 38. That's a mistake. It should be Psalm 83. I apologize for that. Psalm 83 indicates that Israel will be attacked in the end times by a coalition of Muslim states that share a common border with the Jewish state. In other words, those Arab states that have a common border with Israel are going to all attack Israel in the end times. It says they will attack them for the purpose of wiping out the nation of Israel. That would today include Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Egypt and the Gaza Strip. And what's going to happen? The Psalm doesn't tell us, but the Bible tells us. It's going to see here, wipe out Israel as a nation. And here's the ones that are going to do the attacks. You can see them right there. And what's going to be the result? Zechariah 12, 6 says that in the end times Israel will be like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves, so that they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples. In that day the Lord God, Yahweh, Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. Israel, tiny Israel, the size of the state of New Jersey, is going to be like David against Goliath in the end times. Zechariah 12, 9, and in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. There's no doubt, ISIS, fate is already settled. God is going to destroy them sooner or later if they try to come against Israel. It's probably during that time that the prophecy is going to be fulfilled. It's mentioned twice in the Bible, Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 4 and 9. It says, That in one of these wars of the end times Damascus will be destroyed and will never be built again. I suspect that Damascus will start hitting Israel with uh, missiles that contain poisonous gas. And I suspect that the Israelis will respond with nuclear weapons blowing Damascus off the face of the earth. But we know for sure 
Damascus will cease to exist. And then will come the war of Gog and Magog. It's mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Here's what I think is going to happen. Now, this is just speculation, but here's what I think is going to happen. That after the war of Psalm 83, when the Jewish IDF, the, the, the military force, conquers all the Arab forces, the Arab nations will be in a panic, and they will turn to their natural ally, which is Russia, and they will call for Russia to come to their aid. And Russia will come down with all of its current allies, which happen to be Turkey and Iran and, and others like that, and they're all Muslim states. And they will come. So, first you have the war of the inner ring, and now you have the war of the outer ring of states around Israel called the War of Gog and Magog. And so great will be the invasion at that time of Israel by Russia and all of its allies. It will be beyond anything that the Israeli forces can handle. And so we're told that God will handle it. We're told that God will destroy all these armies supernaturally upon the mountains of Israel. Look at this, Ezekiel 38, 18. It will come about on that day when God comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger, in my zeal, and in my blazing wrath. I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. I will call for a sword against him, Gog and his allies, on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother with pestilence, with blood. I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. I will magnify myself and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am Yahweh, the Creator. God is going to handle these Muslim nations. They don't have a chance. <laughs> Franklin Graham recently affirmed this particular scenario of end times. He said the evil of ISIS really shouldn't shock us. It is fully in keeping with their ultimate agenda of hastening a final apocalypse. God's Word tells us that there will be a final battle one day, and it will result in the defeat of Satan and all those allied with him. One thing is for sure, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In that regard, I am reminded of a presentation made a year ago by my dear friend Al Guest, who has a prophecy ministry in Louisiana. He was speaking at the Louisiana Prophecy Conference in Lake Charles. And he spoke on ISIS. And in the process he began to tell about how in his research he discovered all these different names that IC led to ISIS, to ISIL, to IS. <laughs> and he was explaining this to his dear wife Sandy, who has one of the greatest senses of humor I've ever run across in my life. And he said, Sandy sat there for a moment and she looked at all that and she looked up sort of confused and he said, Honey, I don't know much about all this, but I know one thing for sure. She said, the great I am is going to convert is to was. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and all I can say is amen. Well, this brings us to some crucial questions. Why has God regathered the Jews? Second, what is likely future of, his, of Israel? And third, what does it all mean to us, a group of Gentiles here in Katy, Texas, at the beginning of the 21st century? The first question is easy. Why has God regathered the Jews? It's because it is part of His plan to bring a great remnant of the Jews to faith in Yeshua as their Messiah. And what is that plan? Well, the first step is to regather the Jews to Israel. The second step is to bring the nations against them over the is issue of Jerusalem. That's happening now. The third step is to hammer them until they come to the end of themselves. That's the tribulation, resulting in the salvation of a great remnant who will turn to God in repentance. And thus, the future of Israel is a period of great tribulation that will bring the Jews to the end of themselves, but the pouring out of God's wrath will be followed by showering of His glorious grace. For when Jesus returns and comes to the Mount of Olives, we are told that the city of Jerusalem will be surrounded by the Antichrist and His forces. It will be about to fall. He will come to the Mount of Olives. When His foot touches the mountain it will split in half. It says the remnant will come out of the city. They will come up to the Mount of Olives and they are going to bow before Him and they are going to cry out, Baruch HaBa Bashim Adonai, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. This is an illustration by a Messianic Jew from Israel. Folks, it's going to be a glorious day when this great remnant comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledges Him as their Messiah. What a glorious, glorious day that will be. In fact, Jesus Himself said, I will not return to this earth 
until the Jewish people are willing to say, Baruch Abba, Bashem, Adonai. Now, what does this mean to us, to a group of Gentiles here? What does it mean to us? Well, there are many things, but I just want to mention two. One, it's a great testimony of God's faithfulness. Folks, He is fulfilling prophecy after prophecy that was made to the Jewish people thousands of years ago. I want you just to consider a few of the prophecies that He has been fulfilling in our day and time. He has regathered them from the four corners of the earth just as He said He would. He has reestablished their state just as He said He would. He has revived their language from the dead just as He said He would. He has restored the city of Jerusalem as their capital just as He said He would. He has enabled them to reclaim their land from the wilderness it had become just as He said He would. He has provided them with a resurgence of military strength And he has refocused all of world politics upon them. He says in the end times the whole world will come against Israel. Second, what is happening is evidence of the Lord's soon return. Folks, these prophecies, the fulfillment of these prophecies is literally shouting. The soon return of Jesus. Like God has a neon sign in the sky saying, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. We are witnessing the fulfillment of Bible prophecy before our very eyes. And we can be assured that if God is faithful to fulfill every promise He's made the Jewish people, He's going to be faithful to fulfill every promise He's made to you and me, to His church. There are glorious promises He's made to us. He has said that one day very soon, any day, there's not one prophecy that has to be fulfilled for this, that one day very soon an angel is going to appear in the heavens. He's going to blow a trumpet and he's going to shout. And when that happens, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to appear. He's not going to come back to earth. He's just going to appear. And the graves of the believers are going to be emptied. He's going to bring with Him, it says in the Thessalonian letters, it says He's going to bring with Him the spirits of the dead who are in heaven with Him. And He's going to resurrect their bodies in a great miracle of recreation. Listen, this is the one who spoke and the whole world came into being. And there's nothing for Him to speak and the bodies to come back together. Whether they be burned, whether they be in the sea, whether they be in the ground, whether they be decayed, whatever, they're going to come back together in a great miracle of recreation. In the instant of an eye He's going to take their spirits and He's going to put them back together with their bodies. And He's going to glorify their bodies and give them an eternal body. And then those of us who are alive when that happens, and I hope I am, we are going to be translated up following them to meet Him in the sky. And on the way up we're going to be translated from mortal to immortal in the twinkling of an eye. We won't even experience death, the generation that's alive on that day. People say, you cannot, there's only two things you cannot escape, and that's death and taxes. No, it's just taxes and more taxes. There's a whole generation (laughs) that will escape death. On the way up when we meet the Lord in the sky, we're going to be given glorified bodies. We're going to be taken to Heaven. He's going to judge us of our works, not to determine our eternal salvation, but to determine Determine our degrees of reward. And he's going to hand out all kinds of degrees of reward. And at the end of the tribulation, we're going to be in heaven while that's going on. At the end, we're going to sit down with him at the greatest feast the cosmos had ever experienced, the marriage feast of the Lamb. And he's, we're going to sit with him and we're going to celebrate our union with him. And at the end, he's going to stand up and he says, Go, let's go. And he's going to get on that white horse and he's going to break from the heavens. And we're going to come with him. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but it says we're coming with him. Hundreds of millions of glorified. Saints. I, I, you know, I've had a vision of this that, that the Lord comes back to the Mount of Olives, and hundreds of millions of glorified saints are in the sky above, and many are in the Kidron Valley filling it. And He's going to replay a day in His life once before He came to the Kidron Mountain, once before He got up there uh, on the Mount of Olives. And He got on a donkey and He rode it down in the Kidron Valley and up to that eastern gate. And people yelled, Hosanna to the Son of God, Hosanna to the Son of David. And then a week later they were yelling, Crucify Him, Crucify Him. Well, this time we're going to be there. In our glorified bodies. And we're going to be yelling, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Son of God. Let me tell you, I can hardly wait. Every time I sing a song that has Hosanna in it, I get goosebumps because I know one day I'm going to be there to see this. And he's going to ride that great white war charger down and read Psalm 24. It says that when he comes up to the eastern gate, that the gate will say, Come on in, you King of glory. And the eastern gate, which has been, which has been uh, bricked up ever since the, 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 uh, the Turks took it in 1417, I believe it was, uh, every, uh, bricked, up, bricked up ever since there. But it says in the Bible, the eastern gate will be closed and it will not be 
open until the Messiah comes. That gate is going to blow open. Read Psalm 24. It says, come on in you King of glory. He's going to go up on that temple mount. He's going to be coronated the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we're going to be there to see it. We're going to be there to sing hallelujah. What a great day that's going to be. And then He's going to begin His millennial reign. He's going to put us in glorified bodies all over this earth to reign with Him. He's going to reign in His glorified body from Jerusalem. And the earth is going to be flooded with peace, righteousness, and justice as the waters cover the sea. And at the end of that time He's going to take us off this earth. He's going to put us in that new Jerusalem that He's been preparing all these many years. And we're in that new Jerusalem. I think we're going to see the greatest fireworks display in all of history as He heats up this earth and He burns away the pollution of Satan's last revolt. And out of that fiery inferno is going to come a renewed earth, a perfected earth, a refreshed earth. And then He's going to lower us down in that new Jerusalem to that new earth. And we're going to spend eternity, eternally living in glorified bodies in the new Jerusalem, on the new earth, in the very presence of Jesus Christ. And it says, we will see the face of God. The Bible says no one has seen the face of God. We will see it. What that means is we're going to have eternal fellowship, intimate fellowship with our Creator and with the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you, I don't know about you, but I can hardly wait for that day to come. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We're living on board time. That is the fundamental message this evening. Jesus is coming soon, and when He appears that Jewish remnant is going to cry out, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai. And in the meantime I'm going to get up every morning, I'm going to look at the sky, and from the depths of my heart I'm going to cry, Maranatha, Maranatha, come quickly Lord Jesus. And I have a crucial question for you this evening. Are you ready for the Lord's return? Because He can come any moment. Not one prophecy has to be fulfilled for the rapture to occur. hope the presentation you have just witnessed has helped you to better understand what the turmoil in the Middle East is all about. And I hope it has helped you to realize that it is all part of God's end times plan for that area of the world. I hope too it has convinced you that uh, we are truly living in the end times. And in fact we are living on borrowed time because what is going on in the Middle East is a sign that we are living in the season of the Lord's return. Well that is our program for this week. Until next week, the Lord willing, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. You can secure a copy of Dr. Reagan's entire one hour presentation about the Bible's end times focus on Israel for a donation of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. The title of the video is The End Times Focus on Israel. The video will include all that you have seen on today's program, plus an in depth analysis from a biblical perspective as to why the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people and will continue to be theirs until the end of the Lord's millennial reign here on earth. To get a copy of this one hour video, call the number you see on the screen between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday, or place your order through our website at lamblion.com. Again, the title of this one hour video is The End Times Focus on Israel. It could be yours for a donation of $20 or more, including shipping. We publish a bi monthly magazine called The Lamplighter. Each 24 page issue contains a variety of fascinating articles, most of them about some aspect of Bible prophecy. The magazine is free of charge by email. If you would like to start receiving it, just go to our website at lamblion.com and sign up. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 